Hello, um, welcome to our talk. Our talk is called Dive into Avril. Everything a data engineer needs to know, and really everything. We're going to cover absolutely everything about Avril in the next 40 minutes. So you're going to be amazed. Okay, we're not. We're going to skip over a bunch of stuff. Hopefully, I will leave you with a whole bunch of pointers so that at the end of the talk, you'll know where to go to find more information. So who are we? My name is Ryan Scraba. I'm the current PMC chair for Apache Avro. I work at Ivan. I've been there for less than a year. I joined them because I think they have a super healthy and sane attitude towards open source and supporting open source. We're hiring, and you can talk to Lumi down at the Exhibition Center over there. Okay, my name is Ismail. I also I also was I was the previous PMC chair at Avro and committed there and also and Bing. Uh, well, I work now for Microsoft, so also a helpful in open source company. <clears throat> and <it's... laughs> So you may have already heard of Avro. It's been around for a while, and you just passes by all the time. It's just something that works. Nobody really talks much about it. There hasn't been a presentation at ApacheCon on Avro in years. Uh, there's not so much training material on Avro. And that was our motivation for this talk. What is Avro? What can it do? And why? Um, and one of the important things is that um, I, we're doing the talk in the context of Apache Training, which is an incubator that provides materials on Apache projects. Anyone contribute. This will all be in the incubator in the Apache training. You can go get the, all the slides, all of our material afterwards. So if we go fast, if we skip over things, don't worry about it. It's just there. So we're going to cover a lot of material. What is Avril? How does it work? Um, what is Avril? You might know it as a file format. You might note it as a data model. If you use Parquet, you can read records out of Parquet, like rows out of the column store, and they might look like Avril to you. And you might have used it in the past as a code generator with your Maven plugin to generate your plain old Java objects that do these nice data formats, file formats. Uh, you might have used it in Kafka or uh, your own serialization system as a serializer for, for your classes. And from the website, it's the leading serialization format for record data and the first choice for streaming data. So what does that mean exactly? So back in 2009, we had MapReduce, we had... Uh, uh, Doug Cutting and, uh, oh my goodness, Sharad Agarwal, who spun out the Avro project out of, out of Hadoop and uh, in the context of MapReduce. So if we look at the right here, if we look at the left here, what are you doing when you're, when you're treating data in big data? You normally have a unit of work. In this case, it's a structure, and I've got a little IoT sensor record that I'm talking about, and it's got stuff inside. It's got a couple primitives. It's got uh, some, some fields, and it's also got a list of itself. So it's a recursive structure. And that's what we're working on in our MapReduce and we're doing our parallel tasks and it's amazing. And we get to shuffle and sort. And every single node needs to take the records it has and collect them on different nodes so that related records can be treated together. At the time, before 2009, the uh, state of the art was for each of these structures in Java code, typically, were to uh, implement its own logic to say, okay, okay I'm going to write an, a string along an int et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be how it worked. It would be a very, very specific to Java, and it would be a bit tricky to do. And of course, intermediate results in between your MapReduce jobs wouldn't work very well. And uh, because it was all the logic was done in Java, it would be not portable. Now we are familiar with portable serialization. In 2009, the state of the art, if you wanted to serialize something and have it used in a different language or a different version, you'd probably go to JSON. And there's JSON right there, and Kind of no JSON, I'm not going to cover it. It's got the, the schema inside. It's very human readable. It uses uh, UTF-8, but it's also not an appropriate way to serialize billions and billions of objects. So we had the exact same thing happening here. Here's Avro. We call the structure, we call it a schema. Again, it's a record with a name, IoT sensor, and it's got primitives inside, and it's got a collection, contains itself. Here's what we were using before, it's the same thing we were using before. There's an in-memory datum, it's called an Avro. That's something that you're going to want to share between nodes, between versions, or between languages. And uh, it's if you're in Java, or if you're in any programming language, this datum will be in a nice idiom for your programming language. So in Java, it'll be classes with instances uh, laid out by Java. It's all abstract. It's on the heap someplace. It doesn't matter to you. You're, you're used to working in the Java idiom. But eventually, you can have a nice tight serialized binary for sharing it to other languages, other nodes, and it's super small. So this is the actual binary for the data I'm showing here. So that's what Avro is. We're going to cover 
in this context where it covers three parts. We're going to start really low. How does Avro do what it do does? How does it serialize? We're going to cover a bit about how do you use Avro and some of the nice features when you're using it. And Ishmael will take over and talk about Avro in the ecosystem. We're on track. <laughs> so we talked earlier about structures. 99% of the time when we talk about a unit of work, I would probably even say 100% of the time, we're talking about a record. So I had a little diagram with my record, my IoT sensor and some primitives and the, the recursive methods collection inside it. This is the Avro schema that represents it. We're not going to go into all the details. We can see it has a name, it has a namespace. It lists all the fields that will be present in that record. So you have, first of all, a string along an int. Oh, there's some types that Avro supports. For primitives, string log, int, int, and float. And you can also see there's an array. That's another collection that Avro supports. So you can do complicated things, and the array contains itself by its name. Well, that's, that's actually pretty simple. The nice thing is, it's in JSON. So I was just saying, I just said JSON was intractable because it's bloated. But it's not. It's human-readable, it's useful, and you can put lots of useful things into it and understand it at any point uh, without breaking or corrupting data. So you can have this one schema describing your billions of objects, and you can put other things in it. You can put anything in your JSON. Whatever recognizes, it will use for its schema. What it doesn't recognize, you can make your own tools that do validation or that do error handling or internationalization. And I've even seen people put user interface stuff in the schema that applies to every object. So if you don't know how to show a record, you can get the hint out of the schema. So we have, uh, there's the, the schema I was talking about. You've seen it already. There's a binary I was talking about. You've seen it already. I'm sorry if there's anyone that can't see color very well. You can tell that there's five things in my schema and they're just dumped to the binary in order. Blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And the red has things inside it. Again, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. So the serializing a record is simply taking its elements and dumping it out in order. Now, how do you dump them out in order? I've just put some examples up here. You can go to the spec and get everything in detail. Here's a string. You see 61 is ASCII A, but UTF A, and there is the size of the string. One, although it says two. Uh, orange is a float. It's four bytes. That's that's nice, right? We're used to that. There's some ints and longs. Uh-oh. There are weird sizes. These timestamps are only six bytes, and long is usually eight. Weird, huh? And a uh, collection. The list is really quite nice. It's like a string where you dump the size. There's two elements, so we put four. We dump the elements, and then we terminate with to say the, the list is done. So there's some serialization going on there. You can see inside the serialization, there's no information about the name of the record, the type of the record, the type of the fields. It's completely untagged, and that's super important. Uh, here's some, some more information looking at floating. They're all four bytes. That's IEEE 754. It's nothing surprising. All the, all the floating points uh, to be represented. If it's double, it'll be eight bytes. Not surprising either. The integers, their variable run, it's called zigzag variable length encoded, which means bigger values will get more bytes. I'm not going to go into the complete details, but you can see the variable length means we're only using the seven bits at the bottom. And the, the, the big bit tells you if there's more information coming. And zigzag encoding puts, it looks like multiplying numbers by two and then subtracting one for the negative number. And that just puts all of the small numbers in a position where you can discard higher order bits. And that's, that's variable length encoding. Uh, it's, it's actually quite practical because most of the integers you encode, no matter what, will end up being small. That's typically something that happened. And we see timestamps, for example, will always be encoded as six bytes instead of eight. It's just a bit of savings, but it does add up. And we've got a first gotcha. We were talking earlier about shuffling and sorting. When you want to shuffle and sort, you will, might want to shuffle and sort on binary data. So we have, here is our number 42, variable length, zigzag encoded, it comes out as 54. But I just told you, you can add more bits to the end by setting the high bit and adding. So here it added a whole bunch. Now what we have here is the situation where if you were to decode this, it'll always come out to 42. If you were to serialize 42, you could have alternative bytes coming out. Now if you're doing big data and you're partitioning, you want keys to go to the same partition on the same node. This means the 42 could potentially be giving you a different byte array, a different key, might go to different nodes, might not be getting expected results. 
Uh, you should be aware that this is something that, that could happen. It's allowed by the spec. It typically does not happen because when you're on a big data node, when you're on a big data cluster, you're going to be using the same version of Avro and uh, you're going to be generating your own keys. You're not taking untrusted binary data and making a key and then doing your shuffle and sort, or as you think we call it a group by key now that it's so. Uh, but now that we're in modern times, we're going to see why this is important a bit later. Uh, another gotcha is all the floating points use IEEE 754 representation. That has been the accepted standard since the 80s. And everyone uses it. Uh, if you look at Python, for example, uh, Python it says most implementations use IEEE. And I think that actually means all. Uh, Perl, for example, also says uh, it depends on the C compiler that used to compile Perl. What is a floating point representation? But there's one big guy that's out there that doesn't use a floating point representation because it uses text. And that's JSON. And what a JSON means by a number, kind of up in the air. We don't really know. It's not in the spec. It's just some text that you see. When you convert it to a number, when you convert it to Avro, you can have some issues. And that has actually bit us because we were taking some benchmark data that we were running on jobs. It was long, uh, which has about, uh, I think, 19... Yeah, not long has 19 uh, significant digits in it. And a double has a uh, more... 16 by definition. So we're taking this data we wanted to show to the user as a benchmark progressed. And we we're fighting, we were losing precision every single time. This is what was happening is somewhere between doing the Avro, the JSON encoding, the web service, the browser, the React widget to show the results, someone was dropping precision. The other interesting thing is it didn't make a difference because the actual job was bit perfect because they were staying in binary. Uh, something that I did not mention earlier was in the record I gave you, everything is required. We're dumping them in order to the binary stream. Uh, record, you've got five things in it. ID, uh, ID, start time, defects, deviation. They will all be present and always. There's no concept of not being present in the binary stream. And one of the things you are going to need are optional values. People like optional values. Uh, what that is, is in Avro, it's represented by un a union that skews together. So where a record, everything must be present. A union is saying this one field, for example, is of the union type that contains these two schemas, null and float. So in this case, we would call that a nullable, rec a nullable field deviation, and it, it, it can have one of two values. And that's encoded by saying, which of the two values? Uh, it's the second, the branch is the second value in the union. So I'll send the, the branch number that I will send the binary data. And null, of course, you would just send the, the branch to zero, and you've got no, no bytes. A ball has a null value has zero bytes taken to encode it. I mean, I think that's, that's uh, pretty nice because it's, only, uh, it's another little bit of efficiency, no extra bytes. Now, one thing that is interesting, though, this gotcha, this happened to us, a meditation on the nature of nothing. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? How many zero byte datums that are zero, that are null, that can take zero bytes to encode, can you read from a zero byte buff, a zero length byte buffer? Uh, this hit us because we were doing a projection where we had a record. We were taking keys out of it, putting it into another record, values out of it, putting it into another record, and sending them over the wire, and just reading until the values were finished reading. If there's no field in your record, it takes zero bytes to encode it. And if you're waiting for the end of the byte buffer, you might be waiting for a while. Uh, the solution to that is just don't do that. <laughs> yeah, this was something we were doing. We thought it was a simplification. We would read out of the buffer until it was done. In Avro, if you, if you take a look, you always know what to expect coming up next. You always know how many, how many items in the array you're going to read next or how many characters in a string you're going to read next. So if you're using Avro in a custom way, you might hit when you have. So to summarize all the types, there's the sub primitives. I've covered them all. I've talked about them all. Bytes I didn't really talk about. That's just putting binary data and binary data with the same, rec the same mechanism, the size, followed by the actual bytes. There's some named types. These are types that can have, like the record, you have the IoT.sensor and named types. Uh, one of them is the fixed type, which is a binary, um, a specified type. The size is specified in the schema, so you'll never see it in the binary data. And that's kind of neat. Uh, you can put things in the schema that apply to absolutely everyone and save a bit of time when you're 
serializing it. Um, there's another gotcha with it with non-deterministic non information. I talked about the collection of items. There's also a map type. And of course, maps can uh, go in any order. Uh, this is actually where I, where I said earlier, you won't run into bizarre serialization of integers. You can easily run into bizarre serialization of maps. And as a consequence, the, the answer is there. Don't use maps if you're keying in, in your partition keys. Like really, you shouldn't do that anyway. Uh, and specifically in Avro, the binaries will turn out to be different. I'm going to skip over those. Here's something that's interesting, and because it's completely unexpected and a gotcha that you will almost certainly run into, there's our schema. There's all the types we talked about, all the attributes we talked about. There's some attributes that are present and defined called alias and default. So here I have a temperature column, and I've given you some alternative names for it and a default value for it. These are not what you expect. If you are reading and writing using a single schema in isolation, they will not be used ever. These are only used to talk about the past. In this past, the schema used to have these names. In this past, if this field did not exist, you can give it this value. Uh, and that's uh, something that, that is, hits people all the time because you would expect if I haven't given a name a value or just, if I haven't given temp a value and it's missing in the information, it will use a default. That's not the case. There's a lot of gotchas in Avro, isn't there? But uh, that is one shame. The, or many of these gotchas are things that, well, it's yeah. like they have come through the mailing list, so it's really yeah. high, good to have some reference for this also, but you would test that. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I never expected to talk about all these. I mean, I'm watching my watch all the time. One of the last things I want to talk about is we said, uh, we've said we said earlier, because there's no tagging information, there's no types in the binary, you need the schema at all costs in order to read the data that was written. You can't do anything without the schema that was used exactly to written to write the data. Now, what does that mean? The same schema used to write the data. Avro has defined something called the parsing canonical form so you can identify whether the schema is the same. And what it does is it's, it's working on text. It's actually a text thing where you take the text, you apply a bunch of rules, that I'm not going to talk about. You apply a bunch of rules and you get a normalized version with the attributes in a certain order, everything unnecessary taken out, and you can use that to create a fingerprint. So here's a fingerprint for the schema, and that's going to be very important later when you have got a lot of schemas. So I hope I've covered some of the things that are interesting about serializing with, serializing with Avro and how it's done. Uh, I know that when I, we used Avro quite a bit in one of my previous jobs, and when I learned a bit about how it worked, it was really very useful to me, and it answered a lot of questions, like, why isn't there a short time or a short type or an unsigned integer type in Avro? Well, if you're doing zigzag encoding, there's not much reason to have it. So, given that context, we're going to go into a bit more about using Avro, and I'm going to deep dive again into a use case that's super interesting and not really well documented schema evolution, which is something that Avro provides. So we have our sensor record, the one, that same one I've been talking about before. We're going to consider that we're adding a new field to it. So in the past, we had a factory, and they're giving us sensor information off of our machine. And we spin up a new factory, and it's giving us V2, and it's got a new, new information in there. Now, when we're running our reports, we might be getting information from both our factories. We might want to read it with version 1, or we might want to read it with version 2. So here's some binary from version 1, and a report is expecting version 2. This is actually perfectly fine if you have both schemas. So schema evolution happens with both schemas. Given the old schema, you've got five colors, five colors in the binary. Here we have a new schema, new field, new color, and it's got a default value, the same one I mentioned earlier. So if I'm reading full data, I map it into the new one, give it the default. If I'm reading the old schema with new data, I just map it into the schema I'm expecting, and I just throw away the field that I'm not interested in. It's not really too uh, exciting or shocking. So adding a new field is something that's forward and backward compatible. Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Some... No, sorry, I just got distracted there. So this is something where we, we really have to give credit to Confluent. Uh, Confluent and Kafka, where they developed a way of handling schemas, handling and storing schemas. So you can send binary data and say, this is a schema I'm using. This is how you should read it. This is how you should 
this is how is it how it was written so you know how you should read it and you can adopt it using schema evolution to what you expect there we go and the uh, schema registries are nice because they can actually store schemas in versions in order to say that you're always using things that for example adding a field with a default is fully and transitive backwards compatible so um evolution one of the important things to know is given in the api uh the original the original schema and if you want a new schema uh it all of resolution is done by name so here i've dropped a field the remaining fields will be resolved by the name not by the position in the record now is it reordering the fields same thing no issue you can just take what you've got see how it was written put it in the format you expect so these are all very simple uh evolutions this is kind of interesting dropping a field in this case is not forward compatible because if you're writing this data and reading with this one there was no default provided so if you you don't know what to put in that float and that will give you an error at the time when you're reading it i got an ungotcha here but one of the things that's interesting is it's resolved by name renaming fields can be a bit tricky right so, if you're strictly renaming a field, you have to provide an alias and may or may not be backwards compatible. It's a bit fussy and a bit fiddly. One of the secrets is, is because tags are not at all in the binary data, what you can do is you can do your Doctor Strange, create a parallel universe where your schema always had the names you want, and just use this schema to read it. It's got the same types, it's exactly the same structure as the old schema, but it's got the new name. So there you've effectively renamed your your information in the byte and you can read the byte correctly into the new names you want um this one trick drive schema registry is crazy this is actually a feature that i would love someone to implement because it's easy to do it's like really literally doing nothing uh except that schema registries hate it because of that orderly evolution from version to version to version just saying oops just ignore everything you've seen before i really meant to say name this whole time not id but not really happy with that and it would be possible to do. Um, there's some information about if you've got a, a long type, you can effectively, you could turn it to, uh, sorry, you, if you have an int, you could turn it to a long, no problem. That's an evolution that's supported. Makes perfect sense. This is interesting. If you go to a long to a double, we know that will lose precision. You could lose data. Uh, but you asked for it. Like if you're doing an evolution, say I want it to be a double now, you won't lose magnitude, you'll just lose precision. Uh, there's some other rules they're here you can go look at them most of them are just doesn't make sense you know if it's an array does the item inside the array if that something that can be evolved is it an issue is it backwards compatible if so then the array is compatible uh one of the tricky things is unions however the most common case is that you have a, a field that used to be required and you want to trim it into a union with null and long uh, that's perfectly fine it'll just always be present it will never be null if you're reading old data into new data. Now, often what you want to do is take something that used to be optional and make it required. And that'll actually be fine as long it was, as if, as it was always present. But if it's not, you'll end up uh, at an error at the moment of deserialization and your schema registry won't like it either. Uh, typically, that's okay, that works. Because normally if it used to be optional and now it's required, hitting the value, hitting the record where it was not present, it was an error case anyway, and that's why you made it required. So in that case, you just handle the error and move on. Uh, this is the Avro message format. If you're sending one record going across the, the wire, this is how Avro asks you to encode it. Nobody really does it this way. So there's the binary that we see all the time, and it just gives it a header with a little tag and the 64-bit fingerprint that I already discussed. So you would expect this fingerprint to be go read in the schema registry so you know how to read this binary record. Uh, typically, uh, what they do instead, what everyone does instead, is they don't use this format. They just use the binary and put the fingerprint or a version number in the message header, in the Kafka message header. Uh, but the reason this is interesting is it's super useful for debugging or for storing the binary of a single message in memory for temporary purposes. So I've used this all the time. Uh, the Avro file, I'm not going to go into much detail about this. I mean, it is interesting because in the past, our bell was super useful for intermediate results between MacReduce. It's largely been supplanted by column stores when you want to do analytics. Uh, it's, it's a row format. 
It's the same binary you've been seeing, but in done in blocks with a sync marker so you can split on blocks. And it's actually kind of useful. You can use it for saving your Avro data, your small data sets uh, for sharing, for example. But if you're doing analytics, you're al almost certainly going to want to go to something more apt for analytics. Uh, what are the last things to talk about using Avro? Or we're going to talk about logical types because we've seen it's got a very limited set of types that it supports. The logical types I used to extend that, it was added in version 1.8 in a backwards and forwards compatible way. So you can say, if you have an int, I actually want it when you're in Java, I actually want it to look like uh, Java util.date or Java time.date. It will do something intelligent with instances in milliseconds. Um, yeah, it's, and then you can also create your own logical types. So you can support your own specific instances on top of the binary over the wire types that's out of supplied. Future things that we might talk about, but not today. And I'm going to pass off to uh, Ishmael for the yeah. infosys tool. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, this is a lot of OV programmation, I, I know, we know. Uh, but this is intended because most of these things are not documented anywhere. Uh, so we encourage you, if you want to have the documentation, you can be as with all of this, but we will do also as we expect to. Uh, but this, it's true that especially for this subject of scheme evolution, like uh, probably Confluence documentation is better than us, so can be improve. Uh, so what's the position of Avro in the big data ecosystem? So, well, Avro solved some, some problems historically. Was One was uh, having a consistent byte representation, even with so, with these gotchas and it all that exists. Well, you get the same information that you store, so. When do we, if you have the stem, of course. Uh, other one was, well, multi-language interoperability. So there were implementations in different languages. So now, now it's, it's not just the Java world that we had before in Big Data, obviously in today's mostly Python with the start. So, so it's good that, and, and many things are happening in this space right now, like with languages like Rust, you know, they'll have a, a new implementation soon. Uh, and well, the most important is that, well, as, as a file format, at least that the Ryan showed, this is a distributed data friendly format, let's say, because we can split it easily and we can well, compress it and, and, and up in the records to look into it. So, so what are the, historically, though, there, there were like three main uses of our that exist. Well, the first one is obviously the, the big one is the serialization format, the extension over the wire that is used for Kafka and on the streaming system. Second one was the file format, let's re create files with all these records and read them in some data warehouse or hive or this kind of system. And the last one that is a little bit of a hidden one is using it for RPC. So it's a little bit like what protocol buffers do. You define your objects and you define the operations you are going to do and it generates code. It's using like still supported in the code base, but well, in the in the field is like almost zero people using it. Like we have not have any recent comments about that. So I won't talk much about that. Uh, so first, well, using Avros Data Exchange, as I mentioned, is mostly done because of, uh, of a streaming system, and then we have to give all the credit to Kafka because like, Kafka were the ones who made Avro as it is and popularity and use. Obviously, other other systems that are Kafka compatible or improved versions like Pulsar or others support it because this is what is in the in the ecosystem. And systems that, uh, frameworks that I process data in, in a streaming fashion, like Flink or, or Beam, well, obviously have support for Avro as a first class citizen because it's what everybody uses. Finally, there are the folders, and there's an, uh, another thing now, there are many schema registries because even Confluence, Confluence is like the default, but well, it does not have a really open license. So there are many projects like Caraface who try to cover the. So this is like the ecosystem for, for the streaming case. And it, as, as, as uh, we, we can see that well, there are two factors that made uh, Avro's success in this. One is this efficient format, as Ryan said, that is you only have the bytes of the real data, not the old encoding, and uh, well, the capacity to do a scheme evolution. Of. So, of course, well, you, you could have done, thought that, uh, well, why did you go into all these methods? You can use other formats, no? Uh, obviously, well, using Java serialization or Pickle and Python, well, that wouldn't make it because we cannot support, can support other languages. JSON, of course, you don't have a pure schema. TSV, well, as you know, is pretty verbose and it's quite inconsistent because sometimes you can't have quotes or not. You have like to agree on what the comes and not really a specification. Uh, XML is too verbose, but then there are closer formats I could say would be protocol buffers. But the protocol buffer has a really RPC oriented uh, goal, let's say. So it has not really been supported into the data or 
vision, no? Into the lifeline. I mean, into the ecosystem. I cannot have like a year uh, protocol buffers files and read them with high, for example, this kind of use. Uh, flat buffers, that's interesting. That's a little parenthesis. Uh, flat buffers, for those of you who don't know, is a format that we would release uh, some time ago that allows to read without the. Uh, I mean, what they call zero copy read, you don't have to encode the code all the time. They can point to the positions in memory and you take the data as it is. And uh, oh, this is what we call now in memory exchange formats. And Apache Arrow is like the leader in this field. Uh, it's a very interesting project that basically what it has to create, wants to create is an intermediate format for in, in memory that we can share between different languages. So Spark or, okay, for example, if you want to read from Spark, but you are in Python and use Pandas. Well, if we put this in the needle, the idea is that you don't have to re-encode and recode the, the this why I mention this because well this is kind of an, an evolution of, of the idea of what uh, Avro does record by record but with a different approach. And what's interesting is that as as you see both me a little bit tough read, but well, when you read from one language, you can represent in memory in a, a, a real compatible way, compatible way. And uh, and our, there's a project called Avro2 who is doing this now in in the, in the out. This is a Rust project that is reading Avro as Avro records. I, I saw some of the benchmarks and they're they're pretty good. They're, I mean, what was a surprise for me is that they are even with a different representation, the same data is almost at the same the same speed. So that was interesting. Now the second use case is Avro is a file format, of course, as as uh, as I said before, and this is supported by every every data warehouse. Uh, based on file system, let's say, the data lake thing. Uh, obviously, it's also supported by the commercial ones, like we can do import data like this into a Snowflake, BigQuery, and Synast. Only, but this, this I mentioned only the open source that most of you know, like Park, Resto, and Hive. Uh, again, if we think just, that in the in previous part, I was talking about the data over the wire, like, like sending records. In, in, in this case, I talk about files. So if we talk about files, well, why we we cannot use other formats so we shouldn't use it. Well, of course, JSON and XML, but you don't know how to code them, no? But the advantage of a CSV, if you don't have the headers, you can code it in the line you want. So that's easier to split, but well, with JSON and XML, you don't know. Uh, as I mentioned, CSV, he it with it verbose also and, and not really standard. Then proto protocol buffers doesn't have a big uh, support for this use case. So we end up with Parquet. A Parquet, well, is, is sad. The data format that is based in columns, so it's really more efficient for the analytics use case, and it's basically the one who went into this space of file format for for SQL kind of things. And what we mean with pro, co, with is column based. Well, this is how we represent a, a normal table, no? In the columns when we record in 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 a row based form, where we want to save like this. Da, 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 so this is the case. When we record by columns, what we do is we record. Particularly, so this is what how it represented in in, in memory, and was it what the advantage of this that if you want to skip columns, well, you just go to the column you want. Imagine you want to read all the beans here, where you have to do this, 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 this. So it's is really slow with parquet and and, and this column columnar format like org also. But you you go straight from that, and also the other thing is that you can all of these are the same value. For example, if I I want to for example sum all the numbers. I can optimize on CPU, so I can use the one of these operations that work on vectors and 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 have a faster result. So, this this is uh, definitely the, the another another format that let's say is a su successor of Avro, who has a, a, a pretty important and niche use case. You probably have heard about table formats. This is like all the fashion now, all these deltas and icebergs of the world. So these stable formats in reality, I'm going to put a very simple definition. I hope the people who are from this community don't kill me, but for me, it's just metadata to represent files as a table. So, so it's, it's just to put metadata that says, oh, all these Avro files, all these packet files, you can read it like this with this schema. So it's basically like a higher level of abstraction of, of what Avro does, and it, there are formats that even support like either to use Avro as a backend for, for, for this. So this is what it is, but just to have the what image of the context. And uh, so, what are the advantages of Avro? Well, as we as I repeated already, the ecosystem support is huge. Like that, you go with something that is battle tested to the core. Uh, we have an active community that has somehow revived the net in the latest years. This is nice. We have a really stable specification. So basically, we have not broken the file format or the the definition of of the specification since in long years now. 
So that's quite considerable to say. Even changes like introducing logical types so we, that happen in one loop A are still backwards and forwards compatible. So you have a file that you created before, it's still readable without issue. Uh, of course, we have language support for many, many land systems. And, and I want to just clarify some for fun. I, I make this kind of joke at the reading that uh, because because Microsoft it, at the time, at the beginning of this project, uh, created their own implementation of, of the C sharp uh, SDK for the forever. But now, well, now, now is they they are in the standard, so that's good. Uh, and now also, well, there are many other implementations that I mentioned that people there are also many non Apache implementations. And if you run into the Python world, you probably will find that Apache Avro is more used than ours. This is because uh, in the Apache project, we decided to do it only Python pure. That's what Python pure is not performant. So this guy will do the C and then mm -hmm. Abide deep in Python app, of course, with will back. But just to mention that there are many, many, many support that come from the field. Uh, so the state of the project, well, as you can see, it had grown project I think, for many, many years. And we had like a down moment, like in this 2017, 18 time, where we really didn't have many people merging stuff. There were many pull requests that were not out there. There were not releases. If you, if you used Spark from many times ago, you probably have seen that the port it is stuck in one version of Tableau for like for like three or four years. It was because of that. We uh, actively started to work into this and to get releases out. And now we have a cadence of like every six months, more or less, uh, we release. Uh, we also improve all the contributor experience. Uh, what I'm claiming with this is that before you couldn't build the thing, now you have Docker, you have code spaces, all these kind of tools that make it easy to contribute. Recently, there was contributed a new website because our website was doing with this thing called Forest, the business Apache project that is deprecated since like 10 years ago. So now we have a full and something that people are more familiar with. And last year, I also Rigel donated the rusted implementation of Fabro that we is pretty neat to have because, well, post the stack, the fashion thing, no, plus. Um, also, well, what, what's the future of Fabro? That's what's interesting. Uh, See, we have this uh, contract of stability that is so strong, let's say. Uh, changing things is hard and, and we really have to justify a reason to, to change something. So, is it worth to break the spec? It's an open question. Uh, is, is there room for improvement? But the, from time to time, they come suggestions. But I, I, I suppose it's going to be a hard debate we, 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 to break something for no reason. And especially when there are alternatives that are doing kind of the same thing. So, this is difficult. I, I, However, there are many things that can be improved in, in Avro. I mean, not saying that that, that bad, but we, we don't have, for example, the, the release system is uh, is old because the schema, uh, se thematic version in the, the not even exist at the time. So we have a, when we release a new version always, there are people confused, wait, this is not backwards compatible. No, it's not backwards compatible for the implementation, but it's for the format. The format we don't push it, but the implementation kind of difficult. So we have to normalize that at some point. Uh, also, well, we need to do more automation, automation up about, per, for example, when you do a PR, does it hit the performance of this in the past? We don't have a lot of, of work. Well, there is a lot of work into in, in this in, in the upper systems, like say Spark or Flink, or all of those have like performance tests. We don't have it at our level, but we should probably have because sometimes when we find something is because it comes reported from the other system. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, well, there is uh, at, well, all these gadgets that, that Ryan mentioned also, well, show us that we have to probably have to test more interoperability. We already have interoperability test for Python and Java, but well, as you saw, we have like 10 languages, so there's more. Uh, and well, we have to improve the documentation with all these gotchas and, and schema version for information. Uh, with that, well, this, the, the conclusion from, from for this talk and for my side is that, well, no format is perfect for everything. I mean, like, like, some people say like, oh no, well, the, the, I don't know, but Parquet is the one who won, or Arrow is the one who won. No, if, as, as you saw, everything has its use. So use the things that are fixed for the thing they do. I think Arrow has really clear advantages for something. So this is up to you to so just hesitate to, if you want to discuss more or, or join our community or stay here. Well, thank you. Just. Absolutely. 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 Absolutely